Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. You know, vaccines have played a very prominent role in our society over the last uh, 100 years. If we look back at the 20th century, I think it's fair to say that the discovery, development, and delivery of vaccines for infectious diseases were one of the most significant medical and public health uh, developments in that century. What we saw in the last century, we saw the eradication of smallpox around the world. We saw the eradication of polio, myelitis, in most countries in the world. It still is, remains in a few countries. And here in the United States, we saw a major impact on whooping cough, measles, and bacterial meningitis. I predict in the 21st century, we will see vaccines that will prevent autoimmune diseases in general and type 1 diabetes specifically. And I'll go further to predict that we'll see this in the first half of this century. And these vaccines will have also major impact on public health in this century. What I'd like to do today is give you a sort of status update, where we are with respect to type 1 diabetes vaccines. And what I'm going to do is address four different questions. Why do we need a diabetes vaccine? How do they work? What are, what's in the clinic today? And there are vaccines in the clinic I want to show you. And what diabetes vaccines are being developed in the laboratory today? There's no question that prevention of type 1 diabetes is becoming more and more urgent. What we've seen over the last three to four decades in Europe, the United States, and in Australia is a rising incidence, which represents the number of new cases that occur each year in all of those countries. And in fact, what we're finding is that the number of new cases per year is doubling approximately every 20 years. Not only is the incidence going up, but what we're finding is the greatest increase in incidence is occurring in the youngest children, children ages under the age of five. This is illustrated by what's going on in Finland, which has the highest attack rate in the world. And what you can see here in the green bars represents the incidence in children under the age of five in 2006 to 10, currently 2011 to 15, and as we project for 2016 to 20. And what you see is that for this age group, this is the fastest rising age group, and most interestingly, by the end of this decade in Finland, these young children under the age of five will represent the peak age of onset of type 1 diabetes in childhood. The disease is becoming more and more aggressive. What we've heard earlier this morning from Drs. Bluestone and Von Harreth is that type 1 diabetes arises from a contribution of both genetics as well as environment, which leads to this autoimmune process, which then leads ultimately to destruction of the beta cells with onset of glucose intolerance. And with further destruction, Beta cell mass, functional beta cell mass, reaches a critical point where we have the onset of insulin dependence, or as we know it, overt diabetes. What we're finding is that the interval between the onset of the autoimmune process and the onset of insulin dependence is, become short, is becoming shorter and shorter. It's far more aggressive than it's been in the past. We know that this incubation period is variable. And over the last several years, especially in young children, that interval has been, become compressed. Also, as evidence of it being a more aggressive disease, we're finding, if with respect to genetic risk, an increased penetration to what heretofore had been lower genetic risk groups, thus suggesting that there's an increasing role of the environment to allow this penetration to lower genetic risk groups. This is where vaccines come in. Because we believe at JDRF that vaccines will have a prominent role in the prevention of type 1 diabetes, both in preventing the onset of that autoimmune process, so-called primary prevention, as well as in stopping the autoimmune process after it's begun prior to the onset of overt diagnosed diabetes, so-called secondary prevention. In addition to vaccines having a role in prevention, Vaccines will likely have a role 
as part of a combination of therapies to cure type 1 diabetes. It's conceivable that one will have to induce, stop the autoimmune process, induce durable immunoregulation, and then regenerate beta cells. And if the autoimmune process is controlled, those newly regenerated beta cells would not be attacked and will provide restoration of beta cell function. And thus, we see, a vac we see vaccines not only playing a role on the prevention side, but also contributing to a cure of type 1 diabetes. I just want to take a moment and just share with you JDRS prevention strategy and its goals. Our goal for prevention is to address prevention of childhood onset type 1 diabetes. We know this is a group that we can target, and we know, as I've pointed out, that this is the group having an increasing risk of disease. In addition, we want to prevent type 1 diabetes in relatives of individuals with type 1 uh, diabetes, as you heard from uh, uh, Dr. Bluestone earlier this morning. The overall strategy for primary prevention, which as I noted was, is prevention before the onset of the autoimmune process, is the concept of immunizing every child to prevent type 1 diabetes, so-called universal immunization. At the same time, obviously one would, be, would, would uh, immunize relatives who are at high risk for type 1 diabetes. On the secondary prevention side, now secondary prevention is prevention after the onset of the autoimmune process. There, one would screen for risk and screen all children for risk and with the idea of intervening with interventions. In that setting, diabetes vaccines will probably be a part of a combination of therapies as discussed by Dr. Von Harris. And vaccines will be used to induce durable immunoregulation to confer long-term prevention. Can we screen for risk today? We can. Today in the United States, we're screening, and the United States, Europe, and Australia, we're screening over 20,000 individuals every year through the auspices of a group that's called TrialNet, which is run through the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. Uh, the screening is free. And individuals are then followed to understand better the natural history of type 1 diabetes. And these individuals are offered the opportunity to participate in clinical trials. If you or your relatives are interested in participating uh, and being screened, uh, the website is just noted here, www.diabetestrialnet.org. So let's turn to how vaccines work. What we've learned is, and as you've heard this from uh, Blue, uh, Drs. Bluestone and Von Harris earlier this morning, in type 1 diabetes, there are these pathogenic, destructive, what we call effector T lymphocytes or T cells that are destroying the beta cells of the pancreas. And they're not being controlled by these cells shown in green here, these regulatory T cells. We have an imbalance here. This contrasts to the healthy immune system where we have this balance. This imbalance occurs either because of a increased number of effector cells, or lack of response to regulation, or a diminishment in number or function of regulatory T cells. Specifically, what vaccines have to do is either educate or re-educate the system. We have to either prevent, in the healthy state, ever becoming, uh, becoming this imbalanced, pathogenic uh, diabetes state, or if it's occurred, reversing it with vaccines. And the way vaccines will do this will be specifically, they will decrease the number of autoimmune effector T cells and simultaneously increase the number of regulatory T cells to restore this type of balance. Several, as I'll show you in a second, several uh, type 1 diabetes autoantigen vaccines have been developed. And there are a couple principles I just want to share with you. The first is they've been rationally designed based on our understanding of the immune system and immune tolerance. And they're composed of the autoantigens of the beta cell that are recognized by the immune system. And in some cases, along with other molecules that confer immune tolerance. Some of the vaccines are administered systemically under the skin or into a muscle. Other vaccines are administered through a more tolerogenic route into the nose or into the mouth. And we know administration of antigens through those routes is, tends to be tolerogenic, as evidenced by the fact that we're tolerized to most of the foods that we eat coming through the oral route. In general, 
these vaccines should be safer than general immunosuppression because they're targeting the components of the immune system that are deranged or defective in type 1 diabetes, and that is the beta cell specific part of the immune system. They leave intact the general immune system that's required to fight bacterial infections and viral infections. And last, and I think this is quite interesting, some of these uh, technologies represent platform technologies that are applicable to multiple autoimmune diseases as well as allergic diseases. And the reason this is important, this increases their commercial applicability and makes them very attractive for industry to get into this game and develop these vaccines. Today, in the clinic, there are five different ongoing vaccine trials, as noted on the slide here. Four of them are prevention trials. One of them is a recent onset trial. And of the prevention trials, uh, three of them are uh, secondary prevention trials, but there is one primary prevention trial. It's worth noting that three of the trials are using insulin, administered either through the nasal route or the oral route. The two other trials are being conducted by two companies using other beta cell autoantigens, not insulin, one's called GAD, and the other is uh, a peptide of heat shock protein, uh, 60. These trials are being supported uh, by uh, multiple groups, and the uh, outcome of these trials will be known over the next several years. But in addition to those vaccines in the clinic, there's a plethora of multiple vaccines being developed in the laboratory, being tested in animal models, and moving into the clinic. And I'd like to divide these up into two different groups. The first group, as shown on this slide, are vaccines that are more soluble. They're not particular vaccines comprised of beta cell proteins, beta cell autoantigen proteins, or peptides, small portions of those proteins, or in some cases, uh, DNA that encodes a beta cell autoantigen protein, which when uh, administered to the body, then expresses that protein. It's interesting, some of these uh, vaccines, as I noted, are being administered systemically, some are being administered through the oral route, and others through the nasal route. One vaccine technology that JDRF is supporting is the concept of an oral vaccine that's comprised of beta cell autoantigens, and more than one autoantigen, that's expressed in lettuce leaves. And this can also be engineered to target tolerogenic principles uh, in the GI tract. There are, we're also supporting the efforts of Mark Peekman at King's College, who's developing a peptide vaccine that in many ways mimics allergy vaccines that would be administered repetitively. And one can put peptides representing multiple beta cell autoantigens into such a vaccine and administer those. Now, in addition to these soluble vaccines, the other types of vaccines that are being developed are so-called particle-based vaccines. And they're comprised of a beta cell autoantigen, a long immune tolerizing principle. Here's an example of a program at a biotech company called Selecta that the JDRF is supporting in which the autoantigens are encased in a biodegradable, biocompatible matrix along with immune modulatory uh, agents. Another example also supported, and all these are supported by uh, JDRF, another example is a nanoparticle vaccine being developed by Per Santa Maria in Calgary along with a biotech company called Parvis, in which a nanoparticle is coated with a peptide in the form that the T cell normally sees it. But the particle does not have any of the other signals that are required to actively signal a robust immunogenic T cell response, and, then one, and thus one uh, uh, stimulates a tolerogenic response. And the last technology that's shown on the slide here is technology being developed by Steve Miller, who observed that if he generated cells outside the body that he killed off with a chemical in a very directed way, through a process that we call programmed cell death. So it resembles how cells die in the body. Cells die in the body all the time, are taken up in the spleen, and are recognized as self, and we tolerate ourselves to self that way. What Dr. Miller has done is mimic that process outside the body, and at the same time, he couples to those cells autoantigens, in this case, autoantigens corresponding to beta cell autoantigens. And when administered through the intravenous route, they're taken up by the spleen, and this confers tolerance. And in fact, this approach has moved into the clinic for multiple sclerosis, and our hope is to move us into the clinic for type 1 diabetes. At the same time, we're asking the question with Dr. Miller, is it possible, rather than using a cell, could we use a particle 
that would look like a cell and trick the body into thinking this was an apoptotic cell so that this could be an off-the-shelf type approach to providing a cholerogenic uh, vaccine. So in summary, what I've tried to share with you is that diabetes vaccines are being evaluated today for prevention of type 1 diabetes and we're thinking of them as part of a cure when used in combination with several other things. In addition, we're finding you know, that multiple vaccines are being developed that can induce in animal models antigen-specific immunoregulation. And this has really been benefited from our improved understanding of both type 1 diabetes as well as our profound and increasing understanding of immune tolerance and how the immune system works. Third, as you saw, there are five vaccines in the clinic today, and there are multiple vaccines in the pipeline that are moving forward. And last, I just want to note that JDRF has and will be continuing to fund the discovery, development, and hopefully delivery and clinical trials of multiple vaccines by working with the academic sector as well as the commercial sector in the years ahead. So thank you. Thank you.